going to talk a little bit about Hanford tonight. There's a rally coming up this Sunday up at the uh, up at Richland. It's a ways away, but uh, it's going to be a big rally. It's uh, sponsored at least in part by Occupy Portland, and uh, we're going to uh, just move right into this. We've got this a guest far right, Lloyd Marbet. Then we got Chuck Johnson. Far right. And then we have Miriam Gurman. Did I get that right, Gurman? You got it right. All right. Yeah, thank you. So we should probably start off with Lloyd. Before we get too far into this, Lloyd, uh, I'd like to uh, maybe just you could just briefly mention a little bit about that interview you did with Janet Sherman, and we can put up your uh, your uh, uh, contact information so folks can get a hold of you and want to get that that DVD. Well, uh, as you know, Jim, you were instrumental in this DVD happening. Mm -hmm. uh, we in December of uh, last year, we went up to uh, or December of 2010. It's been a while. We huh? went up to Seattle to interview Dr. Janet Sherman, who um, has been a toxicologist involved in researching the cancer impact of environmental degradation of all kinds. She has focused on radiation and in the process she has written a book, Life's Delicate Balance, and she, even more importantly, and Helen Caldicott mentions this, she was the editor of the Chernobyl book, which uh, is an analysis of the catastrophe and its impact upon people and the environment. And as a part of the DVD that the Oregon Conservancy Foundation put together, which is entitled At the Source, um, we have both of those books in PDF format on, the, on this DVD. They're available to anybody in the audience who would like to review them. And keep in mind, this is very quality material. The New York Academy of Sciences published the uh, Chernobyl book, and they put a price tag of $150 on it. And uh, this is uh, free is a kind of a hard bargain to, mm -hmm. to over, you know, to put aside. So I encourage people to get it. And the even though we're going to be talking about Hanford, the health effects of radiation covers Hanford. It mm -hmm. covers all the nuclear mm -hmm. operating installations in this country, and it's an issue that people need to educate themselves on because nobody's really going to protect you like you protect yourself. Right. Well, isn't isn't Hanford reputed to be the most polluted spot in the Western Hemisphere? Well, you know, it is. Uh, it has two thirds of the nation's waste and by volume and it is the most contaminated nuclear site in the United States. Mm -hmm. Amazing. You know, and it's what? Upriver from us, up, by up the way. Upriver, a couple hundred miles upriver from us, a uh, 580 square mile reservation that was created in 1943 as part of one of the largest top secret military operations in the history of human warfare. That's Hanford. Mm -hmm. And because of its secrecy, there was very little attention given to oversight, transparency, mm -hmm. and they've gotten away with murder. They have thrown contaminants into the soil. They were attempting to produce as much plutonium as they could to create nuclear weapons. Those weapons, for instance, uh, that plutonium went into the, 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 the fat boy bomb that was dropped on uh, Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, it was also part of the uh, Trinity blast that took place before that, um, there, there is contamination that is beyond imagination that they're having to deal with there because they slurried waste into the ground. They did once through cooling into the river. At one time, Hanford, the Columbia River was the most radioactive uh, river in the world. And that's uh, saying some compared to what happened, something. happened and in there's Russia. Still, <laughs> there's still radioactive contaminants in the groundwater flowing into the river. I mean, we're in this for the long haul, and the, the people there, God bless them, are doing their best to try and clean this thing up, and they need, we need to make, keep the push on to do it before yep. they start doing more, and they are doing more, mm -hmm. and you know, Chuck's here to talk about yeah, just gonna Columbia ask Generating yeah. Station, and Miriam, bless her heart, with Occupy Portland, mm -hmm. is, is the, you know, the group that has put the focus once again, on continuing to um, oversee what's going on up the river from us. Mm -hmm. It's very terribly important. Well, Chuck, you're with uh, Columbia Riverkeeper. Yep. So you must have uh, a little bit of experience uh, studying the effects. I know Chief Johnny Jackson and uh, Wilbur Slockish up there from the Yakima Reservation, you know, mm -hmm. they say that they, they have reports and they've actually seen fish that were you know, totally, you know, 
wrong. Uh, wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well put. Mm-hmm. You know, you could just stick your finger through them. They were just mm-hmm. uh, so soft, and uh, um, and uh, the eyes were all messed up, and uh, and uh, you can't even these folks that have this subsistence culturally and religiously, and and, uh, and 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 physically they eat the fish, and they say you can't even eat, but what once or twice a week or something like that, with 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 uh, certainty of not begin becoming ill. Well, I, I think uh, the river was certainly more contaminated when they were running the the uh, coolant water directly from the river through the reactor and itself, and then back in. It was the nine river. reactors, wasn't it? Right. So there was. That's why that during that period uh, they did say that it was claimed that that the Columbia River was the perhaps the most contaminated, radioactively sure. contaminated river in the in the world. They stopped doing that, but uh, there still is contamination. But it I, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that. I think it's an exaggeration to say that, you know, I mean, uh, Columbia River salmon is still, I don't know if safe, safe is always a relative word, but it's a, it's a, safer. it's safer. Well, to I'm glad to hear than, that. Yeah, then uh, there are other uh, contaminants as well, not just the radioactive ones to be concerned about. In fact, uh, Columbia Riverkeeper, um, I'm on the board of Columbia Riverkeeper, just let me clarify that, but the, our staff has, has been active in uh, passing a rule and working with the tribes and getting a, a, a much more stringent standard, in Oregon anyway, as to what types of contaminants are, are allowed in fish. Um, and uh, and that's, that's going to uh, hopefully have some long-term effects, and I know the state of Washington is considering the same types of rules. All these things can get thrown out in a minute, though. If we had, you know, if we allow as some would have us do in, in the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, if we allow the contaminants that are already in the groundwater and the ones that are likely to get there, just to go ahead and flow to the river as as uh, as being proposed, um, the the waste tanks um, in the Central Plateau at Hanford, where uh, the waste from the uh, production of, of plutonium, where they took the the fuel rods and ran them through these long canyons with, with solvents that extracted mm. out the uh, plutonium uh, for bombs, left a lot of waste, a lot of extremely complex, highly toxic, and difficult to deal with waste. And, uh, and that's this all is, still there then? Yes, and some of it's already leaked uh, out of tanks and into the, into the ground, and the, some of the proposals are, or the, the main proposal right now, is to leave it there and allow it to go ahead and get to the river. I know strontium ninety is on the way. Not in the tanks, though. In the in the tanks, they're, no, they're the proposing tanks, to vitrify. Exactly, but the, what's already the, the escaped. The waste that has come out already. Yeah. Right. The, it's the waste that's already in the exactly. ground. Exactly. Right. right. And and uh, the tank waste um, is, uh, you know, there's a proposal for a vitrification plant. Uh, it's it's been actually in constru- under construction for uh, how long has it been? Too long. I don't know. At too least, long is a long time. At it's least, at long. least fifteen years. I billions think billions of dollars, something, something yeah, along those yeah. lines. In any case, um, there's and they're literally designing it as they build it, which is the reason why yes. it's been delayed because they've designed it wrong as they built it, yes. causing them to go back and redo the process. Well, has there well, ever been one built before? No. Oh, um, that explains and, it. And uh, not here. There bit, is the one in France. No. Uh, is it successful? Yeah. It, but but it's successful only in that they know what they're receiving as far as the, the right. waste that's coming in. So it's a whole different story. This is the problem with yeah. the Hanford this waste. Is yeah. the the Hanford waste. Right. Each tank is unique. Each tank has a unique right. uh, blend. Uh, combination <laughs> of solvents and uh, radioactive materials. And because the radioactive materials are constantly changing because you know they break down into different particles, Keeping track of exactly what concentrations of, of which element are in each one, um, you know, is, is becomes important, and also makes it difficult then to apply one uh, solution to all the tanks because they're all a little bit different. Well, you know, I had never thought about yeah. that. I figured they could just vitrify each one of them and it would all be the same, but it doesn't work that way. And the radioactivity is, well, the, the solvents themselves are difficult to put in a solid form because they're solvents. They're designed to, you know, break through things and break out of things. Of course, and yeah. and the uh, and the radioactivity itself also weakens uh, uh, the uh, the glass that they're trying to put it in. So, and then there's the additional problem that that their scientists have uh, whistleblowers have been saying uh, in the la- within the last year that potentially uh, there could be a, a criticality accident in the process of moving the waste into into the plant itself. Uh, 
that uh, you could actually have a fission reaction and release a large amount of radioactivity. Uh, in the worst case mm -hmm. scenario. I see. Well, you know, this has <coughs> given us a really good uh, uh, foundation for, for uh, Miriam to explain why we want to have a rally up in, in that area. Well, I have to say that the rally idea came about from a friend of mine who is in Occupy Portland. And she's from the Tri-Cities, and she's here now. She moved her family because of the questions about where she was living due to Hanford. She was living nearby. She was Hanford. living in Hanford and she was an organic farmer. And how can you be an organic mm -hmm. farmer when you have not only uh, farm chemicals pouring into the area, but you also have an unknown amount of radiation coming in as well, uh, you and know. Would probably fluctuating too. Exactly. And nobody's really testing that or at least not telling the people, at least as far as I am aware. Mm -hmm. So people up there from, again, from my understanding over the last half a year is that um, there's not a lot of information that goes out about what's really in the air, what's really in the, in the soil, what's really in the water. Um, so people don't know if they care, they can't find out what it is they're, they're eating. Mm -hmm. you know? So anyway, she moved and she talked to me about it and she said, you know, why don't we do something? I said, why don't we start by asking people if they know what Hanford is? We're in Portland, we're right down river, you know? figure if, uh, if a boater takes, you know, if you kayak from uh, Hanford down here, it takes, I don't know, four hours, whatever it might take, five hours, whatever it is, right? Well, it's boat. the same amount of time. Driving's going to take four hours. Right, there you go. It's the same amount of time uh, down the water as, you know, bringing plutonium downstream as it is for a boater to get here, you know? So anyway, we, we asked people in Portland, do you know what Hanford is? Simple question. And what we got was no. We got, well, I've heard of it. It's that nuke plant, you know, mm -hmm. and mostly people didn't know. So I said to Heidi, why don't we have a day of awareness, you know, and bring in speakers who know what they're talking about, and we just create the platform. And in talking about this to different people who do know what they're talking about, like Chuck and Lloyd and, and Tom and Paige and all kinds of folks, what we understood was the missing link up there is external oversight. So that folks can find out what's going on in a real transparent kind of way mm -hmm. and have real facts come out and tell the public. So we decided that's our focus. We're going to create the platform for speakers to come, talk, do their thing, in, enlighten people, bring education, and at the end of it, uh, and while asking for external oversight, and at the end of it, provide a way for us to move forward. You know, mm -hmm. and, and one of those ways moving forward is, first of all, we've got the CGS plan up there. That's the nuke plan up there. And what are we going to do about that? And Chuck, I'm sure, is going to talk about mm -hmm. that now. The existing but nuclear the reactor. Existing, right. The only yeah. one in the Northwest. And um, thanks to Lloyd for shutting down Trojan. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that's and that the last of the ones <laughs> in, the nu in the Northwest. Yes, that's last how of I the like nuclear power Yeah, plants. okay, okay, good. good. The good. last. It's See, gone. I'm learning every day, you know. <laughs> um, and the other is... Uh, I'm not sure where my train of thought went, but the other is basically just to let people get in touch with Congress, let them demand sessions for external oversight hearings and things like that it, that it, we can do. What needs to be created is a, an independent regulatory entity mm -hmm. that has responsibility for the safety oversight at Hanford. Um, and uh, amazingly enough, after you know this again, this is an you know Hanford's been in existence since 1943, and in that whole time, there has never existed an independent regulatory entity responsible for overseeing the safety of this operation. By independent, you mean independent of the three agencies Indep that have to do that's with That's right. It? Independent yes. of the agencies that are directly responsible for what's taking place right. at Hanford. And if somebody wants to read a history of Hanford, I, I have not finished this book, but it is excellent as I have read it thus far. And I would recommend it. It's, called, it's entitled On the Home Front, the Cold War Legacy of the Hanford Nuclear Site. And uh, I got this off of Amazon. I'm sure it's available at other places. But uh, it's by uh, Michelle uh, Gerber. So if anyone's interested, I recommend that. And when we mention the DVD, by the way, if you email me or call the phone number that's up on the screen, yeah. we'll send this to you for free. So, And if you want, to re want me to remind you what the name of the book is, we'll do that as well. And 
importantly enough, what Chuck's going to bring up about Columbia Generating Station is terribly important from the from the standpoint of the synergistic impact of having not only a cleanup operation going on but a an operating nuclear plant and the last of the operating nuclear plants in the Pacific Northwest 10 miles from Richland north of Richland right yeah uh, just to pick up on that uh, the Columbia generating station um, it doesn't even have the word nuclear in it so a lot of people don't even realize that it is a nuclear power plant. I mean, you certainly wouldn't know just from the name. Other than the locals, then. Well, even the they locals don't know. Don't know. They don't know. Yeah. We just got Seriously. mail today saying that we do not have a nuclear power plant. What do you mean you're coming up here to talk about a nuclear power plant that right. doesn't exist? Wow. It used to yeah. be. And by the way, this is a plant that's been operating since 1983. That's right. So, so. It, it came into, it was one of the, some people, some old timers may remember the Washington Public Power Supply System, whoops. Uh, which was aptly this, named. So. Yes, <laughs> it was, and, and uh, they were attempting to. There was a group of public utilities, mainly based in Washington, but some in Oregon, that publicly owned utilities that were trying to build five nuclear power plants in Washington State, and uh, three of them were at Hanford, two on the coast at Satsup. Right. Only one of them was actually completed, and that's, and that's whoops number one, which mm -hmm. is no now, whoops number two. No, it's no, no actually, it was whoops number one, at least from what it says in this book. Oh. No well, kidding. I think they're wrong, but anyway, could be. Uh, <laughs> it was, it's, it's, it's one big whoops, anyway. It, it was a it was a big whoops. It, it ended up uh, four and five. Uh, one, two, and three were all put into the Bonneville Power Administra Administration rate base, and so we've been paying for this plant through our Bonneville Power rates, along with the two others that weren't completed. Four and five didn't make it into the rate base. That's and from it, the coast there? Well, it was one on the coast, and it's very complicated, but one on the coast and one at Hanford, and they defaulted. At the time, it was the largest municipal bond default in, in the country. That's right. There's been some <laughs> since that have been larger, but it, at, up to that point, it was the largest one. Okay, so they finished this plant, and rather, it became rather quiet, uh, it, it, uh, in part because so many other things were happening at Hanford, so much additional information was coming out about uh, some of the contamination that was there. Uh, people were focused on that and to some degree I think the uh, Columbia Generating Station, you know, they changed the name from Whoops 2, they, changed, they got rid of Whoops, it's now Energy Northwest. Uh, they called it the Washington Nuclear Plant Number 2 and then they changed it to the Columbia Generating Station. Um, what's happening right now is that these plants are designed to last for 40 years. All of them were originally designed to, to have a 40-year life span. Because the nuclear power industry was stopped in the late 70s, mostly by economics, but some, to some degree by our efforts uh, in, in opposing them, and by Three Mile, Three Mile Island. Island right. right yeah. And then later Chernobyl. But uh, they, they uh, were not able to build any additional plants and they weren't able to get the financing for additional plants. So they want to run these plants an extra 20 years longer than they were originally designed to run. And they're doing this all over the country. It's a giant yeah. nuclear experiment. And they're getting rubber and we're part of it. pretty much. We're part of that nuclear experiment in the Northwest. Right. You know, we have one of the reactors in it. And it's a, it's, it's a, to me, it's a game of Russian roulette. It's not, I don't know how many chambers exactly we have, but we're clicking them. Every time we, every year, and every moment, we allow these reactors to continue, right. um, even well, in their regular lifespan, let alone beyond. The reactor number one at Fukushima um, had just been relicensed past 40 years before it went before the accident. The people in in Fukushima and in the community, the people working there, were completely. They were supremely confident of all of the safety uh, aspects of their plant. The local community was completely uh, behind it because a lot of people worked there. Mm -hmm. It was a similar situation to what we have in the Tri Cities right now. That's can I can I just add that earlier today um, there was another article about A15 in the Herald this morning, mm -hmm. and one of the comments that went into that article was by the American Nuclear Society, the branch up there in Tri Cities, you know. And one of the things they said was that it was a definitive statement, and I'm not quoting because I can't remember exactly what the quote was, but it was basically, nothing has gone wrong here and nothing will go wrong here. Of course. And it was amazing to me, being the newcomer, not in the anti-nuke industry uh, movement, but, you know, really hearing from these folks who can say that in right. a definitive way, well, that not only has nothing gone wrong, but nothing will go wrong. 
The yeah. reactor, the, the, the Columbia Generating Station nuclear reactor, which I try and <laughs> say that mouthful in order to properly identify it, um, is a boiling water reactor. Mm -hmm. It's built by General Electric. Uh, it's a Mark V. The Fukushima 1 through 3 were, were uh, uh, Mark 1s. And so the design has been altered to some extent, but it still has some of the same characteristics. And the other thing that is, is, is a kind of a similar characteristic to it is that there is a, apparently a, a, a growing concern about the potential earthquake activity yeah. that could take place at this reactor. Right. Now, they're in for relicensing. They have a license out to 2023. And they want to add 20 more years onto it, even though they've got still more time to operate with the existing license. And the licensing process that uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uses for extending these licenses is a rulemaking. It's not, it's not a formal contested case proceeding where you test the evidence that comes in. And not only that, they limit the evidence that mm -hmm. comes in. For instance, they're not, they're not going to require that, the, that the, uh, this operating nuclear plant um, m or mandate that the, this operating nuclear plant use any of the lessons that are learned from Fukushima. Right. It's exempt from that. Um, they're not going to require that there be any review of earthquake activity in the vicinity of the plant, even though... The last time that they conducted a review was 30 years ago. Right. 30 years and ago. And they've discovered new faults uh, right. since then There's in the area. Uh, it, and there's it, ongoing seismic activity. It kind of reminds me of the ostrich in the sand. Yeah. You know, it's just out of sight, out of mind, business as usual, and which is the way this nuclear industry is operated. And that's the reason why we careen from one um, supposedly impossible accident scenario to another. Mm -hmm. You know, Fukushima, when Fukushima happened, I was floored. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was so used to hearing the nuclear industry say that the worst case nuclear accident in one nuclear plant could never happen. That when they said that there were three of them going down together, it's just, it, it's, it leaves you speechless. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though we don't see much in the news about Fukushima now, that accident's still going on. Mm -hmm. the, those reactors are still melting over. down. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, like, for instance, I brought a, an article that, that appeared in the Oregonian a week ago. They're measuring um, radiation in seaweed 375 miles away in the Pacific Ocean from Fukushima, and they've picked up radiation levels in kelp off the coast of California. Right. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's this insidious assault upon the environment that you can't see, taste, touch, or smell, and you're dependent upon your government supposedly protecting you, when in mm -hmm. fact your government is controlled by these very industries themselves, yep. which is like the Occupy movement. One of the things that I appreciate about the Occupy movement is doing something about corporate personhood, because we need to take the military industrial complex and the nuclear industry and the fossil fuel industries, yep. and we need to get them out of our government so that we as a people can make informed decisions about how we are going to protect ourselves and future generations to come. You know, I think if the folks around Fukushima realize that uh, they had their generators, backup generators in the basement, and they were right on the coast, they might have had a little bit of second thoughts about feeling so comfortable about it. Well, <laughs> but it's always that. You know, uh, there's the thing about nuclear power is that it's extremely complicated to, uh, you know, it, it's so dangerous that everything has to go right. And uh, engineers who are involved in it, I think get seduced by the, by the problem and they get excited about it and they feel like they've solved it. And, mm -hmm. um, and then they get defensive when you point out some of the, the uh, problems and flaws. And, and it's a natural human characteristic, but we, we can't, uh, what, what we've learned is that we cannot rely upon the so-called nuclear experts to 
assure that we will not have a catastrophic accident. Well, I, I, and there, well just, just one thing I want to point out about that's similar at the Columbia Generating Station. Lloyd mentioned there are some similarities. One that's really particularly frightening. Similar to Fukushima? To Fushi mean? Fukushima is the reactor number four at Fukushima. Uh, the problem at there was the reactor was shut down, but uh, the spent fuel pool sustained some, some earthquake damage of some sort and started leaking water out of it and began the, the fuel inside of the spent fuel pool, which is you know, it's and a that's misnomer. The other three reactors as well. Right. It, it's it's irradiated fuel. It's it's very hot. That's why it has to be kept cool in, under water. So under its own uh, its own what electron or whatever it has, radiation. It 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 it, 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 it heats go, up what's up. It, exactly. Coals present a real problem. Right mm -hmm. now. At Columbia Generating Station, what they've got is they've got one of those pools too, and it's inside the reactor complex. Right. But what they're doing there, which is at least a little bit better, is they're taking the waste that has sat in the pool long enough to, to reduce the short lived radioactive radiation, and they've transferred it, in, transferred it into spent fuel casts. And then they have a concrete, they have two concrete pads. They've got 27 of these dry casts sitting out there. They're going to build three more concrete pads. Ads, enough to have 90 spent uh, 90 dry casts stored at that site. Now you might think, well, geez, that's just great. But keep in mind, this is waste that's waiting to be taken away. And in this country, there's no place to take it. And in fact, there's no final repository for nuclear waste anywhere in the world. And there never no probably country, will be. Well, who knows? I mean, uh, there may be somebody that'll put a hole in the ground and throw it eventually down into there. But after spending billions of dollars <coughs> on our hole in the ground at Yucca Flats, it got abandoned. Why? Well, it turns out that that Yucca Flats had uh, an active volcano, active volcanic activity that was detected. And what was supposed to be a desert location with only a gambling operation next to it apparently had a whole bunch of water running through it, which could impact anything surrounding it. In other words, mm -hmm. it, if it hits the waste, it can transfer radioactive contaminants from the waste into the broader environment. Yeah. So the whole got abandoned. They also tried to bribe the tribes to take it. Yeah, well, the, the Goshi Indians and, uh, and, course, and a few others, right. and uh, since they since uh, you know they don't want to give them their sovereignty unless they can make use of it, and, right. you know, mm -hmm. they, so they offer them <coughs> a, a small amount of money to to store it on their land. Of course, right. I think the Goshi were uh, the Goshi actually it. were the Started only tribe that decided to go for that deal, uh, but the state of Nevada and uh, to some degree the Mormon Church uh, has been successful thus far in fighting that off, although it's still oh. it's still being fought out. That's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Chuck, you referenced the fact that this is a human experiment. Right. It's a grand human experiment. The whole industry from beginning to end is an experiment. Mm -hmm. After all, why would we allow an industry to operate that's never been able to figure out what the hell it's going to do with its byproducts? Mm. Nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, even after all this time, and so what are we doing? We're backing up waste at all the nuclear power plants, even at Trojan. They blew the the uh, cooling tower down. They blew it up. It mm -hmm. came but down. But the reservoirs are still They blew there. the reactor yeah. vessel down, carted mm -hmm. it off. But all of the dry casts at Trojan remain on site mm -hmm. next to the Columbia River. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's business as usual. Mm -hmm. Out of sight, mm -hmm. out of mind. And it, it, it's unconscionable from the standpoint of our responsibility, not only by ourselves for the environment that we live in, but for future generations that inherit what we leave them. And yeah. this is what we're mm -hmm. leaving them. We're leaving them Hanfords everywhere. Well, and, and the, the point I was trying to make about the, um, about the, I mean, the, pos the possibility of an accident there, it's bad enough um, to have an accident anywhere. Obviously, we're seeing you know how terrible it is in Japan right now. But when you already have this vitrification plant, for example, if it's up and running and is as hazardous as it looks like it's going to be, then you have all these ongoing cleanup activities going on. If you had a, a catastrophic accident at the operating nuclear reactor, it would just blow all of that work and everything completely out of the water. It would, it would contaminate the Columbia River. Uh, beyond uh, you know anything a, that it currently be a would be zone. exactly. I'd, I'd like to get Miriam here too. So we've talked about all this, and it it just seems to me that uh, 
the public does need a good education about what's going on with Hanford. And so what are some of the, the logistics of, of the rally that's coming up so folks will know a little bit about this? Well, the rally's this Sunday, and it's at the John Dam Plaza. That's the 15th. Right, and it's from noon to 5, probably end a little bit before 5. We, and here, there's the... Uh, website there too yeah, so. which yeah. is important because you know people want to get involved they need That's to right. everything that we everything that we have transportation videos sessions with Chuck and Paige mm -hmm. and all of our other teachers are on there everything's on there the press is on there so um, yeah go there and come to the rally uh, one of the things that we're dealing with too is the fact that Bechtel is the main contractor is just making billions mm -hmm. on this mm -hmm. and it's a private company and so back to the external oversight you know independent external oversight we have we, we have a hard time getting involved getting inside what Bechtel is actually doing and so this kind of thing continues to move on every day at a snail's pace and while Bechtel and the DOE are saying give us some more money well for what for your flawed plans mm -hmm. well our plans aren't flawed well who says they're not flawed well the DOE well who's in control oh the DOE well, where's the independent analysis? Exactly. exactly. You know, you, you mentioned it's Bechtel, but in the past it's been Westinghouse, it's been General Electric. Mm -hmm. Both every, who every have four years. And yes. they have enormous it was media holdings. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's what gets me. It's is, floor. <laughs> it's rock. Rockwell. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> the thing about G and Westinghouse is, and is they own an incredible amount of uh, media. You trade corporate so, logos, but the reality remains the right. same. And one of the things that's happened is that they'll do a certain amount of work, and then they, they'll, they'll realize that some of these problems, such as the vitrification problem, are so difficult that they can't really solve bigger them. Bigger than they thought, right? And then they, well, they maybe even knew when they started. But they, right. they'll take that money for a few years, and then when their contract ends, they'll walk away and hand it to the next contractor. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what's been happening, I think. I want to go back to something that Chuck said again, um, because I think it is terribly important that the public know this kind of reality that we confront. And that is the fact that we have two independent nuclear operations going on at Hanford. We've got the operation of a nuclear plant, which in itself can present tremendous hazards to not only the local and, and distant communities surrounding it, mm -hmm. but also could totally, overnight, destroy the cleanup efforts that took place at Hanford. Right. Has there been an analysis of that? No. It's not required for the vitrification facility, which in itself can also have catastrophic accidents, mm -hmm. which could impact the operation of the nuclear plant. Right. And is there a requirement that the vitrification facility be examined to see what kind of impacts it would place upon the Columbia Generating Station? No. None of that has taken place. And so it's just public relations and assurances. Yeah. You know, we got it under control. Honest, we got it under control. Oh, by the way, there's this setback. Oh, by the way, there's this delay. But please let us conduct business as usual. <laughs> and I don't think that in the end that cleans up Hanford. I think what we're doing is, is we're kind of like waist deep in the big muddy and the big fool saying push on. And we re that's why Miriam's um, point of, the, of, of, of this Occupy rally is so terribly important. We need to create an entity that is honestly independent of this operation so that we can have this kind of examination so that we're not like the people of Japan who are forced to deal with a, an ongoing accident that who knows if it ever ends and removes them from their homes and their communities. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to say, as far as that goes, we invited directly the DOE, members of the DOE, to come speak. And I said to them, look, you're in charge of this entire thing. You know, you got a sense. US DOE. Yeah. yeah, US DOE. And um, the response that I got after doing four sets of phone conversations, you know, and group calls with everybody was, no, it's going to be a one-sided conversation. Well, not and if I you're said, there. <laughs> I said, if you're there, it no longer is a one-sided conversation, right? Well, they said, no, we're not going to come. And I said, that's really a shame. That's sad. It is sad. That's it, what I told really Di I, I told her. I said, it's sad. And she said, well, we really don't know that you have 
the points. I said, it's not about me. It's not about Occupy. Mm. It's about the, the educators who are coming to this thing to talk about what they know, and they do know what's going on. So the, the, the following response was, we're doing everything fine. And mm -hmm. I said, come on. I said, if you were doing everything fine, then mm -hmm. the DNFSB hearings mm -hmm. wouldn't That's have right. taken place. That's right. Where's the place. transparency? Can yeah. you say that in Japanese? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, so, what, what's, what I really appreciate about this Occupy rally is it's like, it's sort of like, it's been a very placid pond up there in the Tri-Cities. They got a lot of money uh, in the stimulus to do cleanup. They've done some good work along the Columbia River. A lot of jobs. They sort of have a, a little bit of a peace peace pact going with the environmental groups working on that particular aspect and uh, meanwhile they're trying to they're, they're get going forward with their their uh, relicensing of the Columbia generating station energy Northwest is doing that and all of a sudden this big rock comes flying over occupy uh, movement and lands in the middle of that pool <laughs> and, right. and it's creating a, a big eddy right now and I think I think it you know I, I but I, I'm hoping that it's a positive wave you know a wave that will wake people up Get them analyzing, you know, what they're doing, and really yeah. be looking critically at this. I think the I think the people well, and, and I, you know I think it, I, I think it must be clear here too. I didn't hear Miriam say that when she called up the the U.S. Department of Energy that there was going to be a restriction on what they had to oh, say. Oh no, it, it, no, and they asked me. They said, "What do you think we should talk about?" And I said, "I'll give you ten things right here. Pick." I said, well, "Why don't you talk about what's going on at the at the, at the um, tank farms?" tell us what the problems are. We're here to help. And I said that. I said, we're coming up here to help get the cleanup back on track. And I said, you need the cleanup back on track, right? And she said, well, we do, but we don't think we're so far gone as you do, you know? <laughs> and I said, we're on the same page here. The cleanup needs to happen. It can't just sit there. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, there I was a lot of. I hope you're going to tell people at the rally about I'm this. I'm going to tell people about that. Because this is the first that. I've heard of it, and I oh, think I'm it, gonna tell people. it's outrageous. Yeah. it really is outrageous. It, it really angered me, you yeah. know. And I let her know that. And I'm sure you didn't put any limitations on the amount of time they had to speak. I had none. Yes. I had none. But you you mentioned something about that. There's a ton of jobs there. I have an issue with that too. Yeah, there's a ton of jobs there. You know, people are going to make really good money for a really long time. Mm -hmm. One of the problems with having a ton of jobs and no oversight is what's happening to the workers? And can the workers come out and talk about if there are problems? Mm -hmm. There are problems. Mm -hmm. There's We've been heard, whistleblowers up there. Yeah, there are whistleblowers. Who have gone through hell. Yes, yeah, they have. exactly. Yes, they have. Walt and Donna have, you know, reshaped their careers by being whistleblowers and that Walt's in the basement and Donna is dealing, I don't know, I guess with the DNFSB Are, are they the going to be speaking at this rally, too? No, no, <laughs> not because they weren't asked, but j just due to different things. They're in the middle of suits and things like right, that, and so they really can't. Right, yeah. what they can say. Um, but the issue of the, the culture safety there is huge. And one of the things that gets to us at Occupy is if no one's going to be able to speak up as far as uh, being in a work environment that's going to hurt you, because your job is going to go down the drain because somebody else is in line because the money is so good. What kind of job is that? And that's where we're coming from. So mm -hmm. we did have, interestingly enough, we had one person who spoke at the um, defense hearings a couple weeks ago, the safety board hearings, nuclear safety board hearings, and he was from there and he retired and he said, I want to come and talk at the rally. Well, I don't know what happened. I'm not going to mention his name. But something went down, and he called yesterday and said, I can't do it. And this is the issue, mm -hmm. that when you speak out and say, I am working in the most, I mean, you're working with nuclear toxins. I'm working in the worst uh, environment, and I can't say to my boss, to my management, that I am sick, I can't come in today, right. or hey, I've noticed that this cord is fraying, or this pipe is falling, right. or whatever the case might be, because my job's gonna go, and my family's depending on me, that's gotta end. Yep. And the only way for that to end is again, back to independent external oversight. Mm -hmm. Yep, and, and, well, and, and put, I, well, I put. Well, and, and I think we really, um, you know, this is, this is part of what I hope our message is, is that people, you know, the people who who need this the most, who who need activism the most, are the people who live right in that immediate area. Because it's the, they're the people who are working with this material. Mm -hmm. They're the people who are living living near it, and they're the ones who experience the worst uh, effects if there were a major accident there. So you know, I mean, this is not about attacking the Tri Cities area no. in the slightest. This is about working with the people in the Tri Cities mm -hmm. to deal with a, a problem that 
it's a societal problem. They they were involved in the to some degree. Uh, you know, we had a, a U.S. policy to make nuclear weapons. We had a, a regional policy to use uh, nuclear power to generate electricity. Those are things that they did there. They're hazardous. We need to stop doing uh, the nuclear power. We've already stopped making the nuclear weapons there. We need to clean up our mess there, and we need to do it thoroughly. And this is not a partisan issue. It should mm -hmm. not be a partisan mm -hmm. issue. This is about health and safety. Right, but, but partisan issues are used in order to divide people. Right. You know? I, I think there's two elements more that we need to talk about, too, and that is, is my understanding is, is that at the end of the rally, there's going to be an opportunity for a strategy session amongst yes. activists so that we can answer the question about where we go from here. And also, Chuck, who's been working with Physicians for Social Responsibility, is leading up, and it's very important. I hope Chuck's contact information is on there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like you guys to talk about that. I just happen to know a little bit about it. Well, uh, there is, uh, the, with, in terms of the Columbia Generating Station, because it's been an issue that hasn't gotten a lot of publicity, uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility has, after Fukushima, realized, hey, we have an operating nuclear reactor in the Pacific Northwest, we should do something about it. So they've, they, they organized a series of meetings this fall, and now they've continued into the, into the, uh, through the winter and spring. And we've formed a task force to uh, begin to talk to the people who own it, because that's really that's who can shut it down. That's right. Energy Northwest is uh, consists of 28 utilities in Washington State. So, several of them right across the river. Um, Clark County um, ha PUD is is one of the owners of of the uh, Columbia Generating Station nuclear power plant. So they're getting their energy from there. Uh, well, we all are through the bottom. It, it goes power into the grid. The blends grid. in with everything. Yeah, yeah it only it, fortunately it only produces about 12 percent of BPA's energy. So if if all you did was get your power from BPA, only 12 percent of the electricity is coming from. Uh, the nuclear plant, and it was shut down for eight months last year, including through the, the hottest months of last summer for refueling and then for, uh, to, to fix a, uh, a, uh, a broken uh, cooling, cooling uh, system. Um, and it, um, uh, no, no effect was felt the, by anyone. The, the no one slack noticed. was taken Exactly. Up. Right. Yeah. So uh, most utilities use less than that. Most u if the average for Oregon is 3%. The average for um, Washington State is 8% of its electricity comes from nuclear. And so we can shut it down. And so we're, we're going to talk to the utilities, talk to the, to the, the people, um, the people in who who's, uh, are represented, who represent those utilities, and then also to the, the public themselves. Uh, if their utility is not representing their view on nuclear power, then, then uh, they need to talk to their utility, uh, uh, public utility uh, directors and uh, get them to change or elect new ones. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to add to that, that if anybody who's listening and watching right now wants to take part in that, that they can get in touch with me or Chuck mm -hmm. and uh, come into Occupy or go directly to Chuck. Mm -hmm. We're going to be having meetings with PSR and really going out into Washington to communicate with the people. And um, the strategy sessions open also. Right? Absolutely. Occupy right. so has an office. And, now, and you, right? you know, yeah. here, here's an opportunity where you can get on a bus and what is it, twenty dollars to, to? It's twenty dollars for the entire the day. It's ten each way, and the bus is leaving from City Hall on Sunday at uh, six thirty a.m. And again, it's 20 bucks. And we're also asking people, if they can, to pay for others who can't pay for themselves. So we have a donation link on the site that people can go to. And um, they can come directly and bring money on the day of, too, on Sunday morning as well, and pay extra if they'd like to to support somebody else to get there. Mm -hmm. We also have carpools going up. And again, everything's on the website. Mm -hmm. All right, so that, that there's the website right there. Great, so yeah, people need you. to know about that. You know, I, I was... Uh, a few years back, I remember doing some reading on this subject, and it seems to me I remember that, uh, I forget when it was, in the 40s or 50s, did, wasn't there a, a deliberate release of strontium yes. or of, of iodine? Radioactive iodine. Just to see what would happen with it? It's crazy? called the Green Run. Uh, it, was really, it was 1953, and... Uh, it, it came out, uh, the information about it came out, I think, in the late 80s, didn't there it? There was a release of, yeah. I think, 50,000 documents, of, yeah. of which this book, by the way, is based on. I just don't want to bring that up just to let folks out there know that, you know, it's many levels upon which we have... 
that we have been being they experimented upon. Well, yeah, they yeah. intentionally yeah. released yeah. it just to see what the weather patterns the would do, would. what the plume would do, right. and then they measured it. They didn't tell anyone. And of course, radioactive iodine uh, replaces uh, uh, right. non-radioactive iodine in your thyroids. And many people in in the Tri Cities area, in, in Pendleton, and and in that general region, have suffered thyroid problems. Well, many that was, people. That was the initial fear with Fukushima. Was people were eating these pills because of the uh, the uh, radioactive iodine that right, might be right. out there. So, I, you know, I, that's just bringing that up. I right. mean, there's a lot of things that could be brought up, but right. that just goes to show that uh, there are differences of, uh, different ways of looking at the, at the world and th their responsibility towards us than we have towards our responsibility towards them. Well, and and the, what you're bringing up, it's our responsibility is to provide a motion towards external uh, Whatever the word oversight. you mean, oversight. There yes. we go. Right. Keep in mind, this was a criminal act. I think so. Um, it was experimentation upon people without their knowledge. Right. They, you know, people were exposed and didn't even know they were being exposed. Uh, our government should not be allowed to do that at all. And and the health impacts that they have caused from that is also the responsibility of the government to to help the people that were exposed. And yet, repeatedly what's happened is you have to go to court to try and get any help at all uh, in, in a process that in itself is weighted to those, the vested interests that have the dollars mm -hmm. that can afford to, yeah. you know, obfuscate the, the outcome. Yeah, and the but dip, go ahead. Uh, well, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the difficulty, the difficulty. It's hard getting you guys well, to say anything. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, the difficulty. The fire is burning. Yeah, in, in, get it, in, in figuring this stuff out is that, you know, okay, cancer comes later. Uh, you, you, you got way nuclear, down the road. Sometimes. You got people. You got people right now. The nuclear power people. A lot of them are wandering around saying, "No one died at Fukushima." Right. That is so irresponsible. But of course, they're going to say that later when people begin when the cancer levels go up uh, in those areas of, and, and cancers that are are traceable. You know theoretically to the different elements that have radioactive elements that have been released they'll say well we're not sure exactly how much of that is due mm -hmm. to uh, the release of the radiation it's a perfect it's crime exactly it it's is. very it is. difficult it's, it's, the, it, it's the perfect pollutant industrial pollutant right. from the standpoint of having to to be uh, liable for for who you contaminate right. because if I get contaminated, my body doesn't register the contamination. There's no flag that goes up and says, geez, Lloyd, you got it. And nothing in my body, if a, if, if a cancer develops, puts up a flag and says, well, you know, it's from all that uh, concentration of radioactive material in your lungs or in your bones or whatnot that has, has led to the cancer that you're experiencing. And again, when you try and get accountability, you're up against an industry that literally can calculate what it's going to cost them, you know, to hire their stable of lawyers to go in mm -hmm. and 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 uh, and do the best they can to make your case look like it's unprovable. Right. Until you die. Until and you then, die. And then it goes elsewhere. But what I wanted to add to that is that this isn't something that happened only decades ago. I just wrote our governor and I said, I found out first what our monitoring system was in Oregon for food. And I found out very directly what it was and what it wasn't. And what it isn't is that we do not monitor radiation in food. Right. And I wrote to the governor and I said, this is what I know. These are the facts as I know them. And what I want to know is why aren't we doing this, especially post Fukushima. Right. And not only that, but when are we going to do it? With a plume and of radioactive exactly. material that's heading our way. And the, the response And a food chain all the way exactly. being concentrated. Right. And yep. the response that I got, and this is the point, that... This is from our governor, yes, or his office. Th and anyway. this came into me yesterday. Who's the, a doctor, the, by the way. Yes, the response <laughs> that came back to me said... Please share that with us. He mm -hmm. said to me, while we do monitor some things, we don't monitor food, but we are working on what we need to do. And they're not working on what we need to do. And so one of the things that we are doing in Occupy is we're doing a letter writing campaign and I already have right. a, a, a message in to the governor's office that now, I want to be Is that going up again. on the website? It will be going up on <laughs> good, the website. Good, yeah, yeah. Good. And, um, so this website fact, is very important to people out there that want to do something about this problem. Yeah, so what I'm working on right now is having a meeting with the governor and I want to talk with him directly oh, and, I, and I want to say to the governor and I will say to the governor when 
not why aren't we, but when and who is it going to be who's mm -hmm. going to monitor, what organization is going mm -hmm. to monitor this. And that's really important because once you have an organization monitoring, if the organization monitoring is coming from sort of a set up lobbying situation all the way up to the government um, level, it's not working for the people. Mm -hmm. So we need a group again with our own state and California needs one if they don't have one. I don't know anything about California and what they do have and don't have, but um, we need one. We need. Yeah. We do not know well, what's in our food. Well, and I think you know the, there are two ways that we are, can be affected by Fukushima currently. The, f the first one we we a big chunk of it we already have had was we we got some iodine, measurable, and it was measured and uh, it was be way beyond background. Um, and that's thousands of miles fortunately, away. Fortunately, the iodine does break down quickly. It's very hazardous while it's breaking down because it's fissioning. You know, you don't want to be have it in your body while Can it's fissioning. Can I just say we didn't have headlines on that in the paper? Not I'm just nearly. Saying no, that exactly. Again. but there was cesium and strontium, mm -hmm. well, and those whole, things are not being measured. Whole. Those things do get concentrated Spectrum. in milk. They get concentrated in flesh right. that we eat. They get concentrated in the plants that are eaten. That's they, why Chernobyl was so. Right. Chuck and so I bad. share a common concern here because you know, <clears throat> unlike Chernobyl, which seemed to analyze more than one isotope. The only two isotopes that I've seen discussed uh, from Fukushima are cesium and iodine. Right. I've not seen any talk about uh, strontium, mm -hmm. which is a, an isotope of great concern because of the fact that it can go up through, uh, it land on, deposit itself on grass or, or deposit itself in water and a, and a cow can ingest it into um, their bodies and then that concentrates in their bodies and concentrates in the milk and then concentrates in us. Yeah, the, it's a cal it replaces calcium. That's what's really dangerous It about looks it. like calcium That's why it shows, up, it shows up in teeth, it shows up in bones, it right. shows up in milk. Um, it's, uh, it re you know, it's a very uh, insidious um, radia form of radiation. And these and are also coming important. from Hanford too as well, though, well, not just well, Fukushima. You know, you know, you know listen, I, I don't understand why, uh, you know, we have not continued the studies that were uh, instigated in the past. For instance, Dr. Sherman did a study which gathered baby teeth from, from children right, across the that. United States. Right. They analyzed the radioactive content in those teeth and were able to determine what nuclear fallout was actually putting into the communities of people that were exposed to it. Now, that is an automatically proven way that you can measure right. radiation. Why aren't we gathering baby teeth right well, now? Right. We should, and, and mm -hmm. that is something that we, we need to talk I, to I, PSR I, about. That right. is actually something that the, the original uh, activity of physicians for social responsibility when they were first formed was collecting baby teeth right. uh, and proving through the presence of strontium in them all over the country, the United States, that above ground nuclear testing was depositing radioactive material that was measurable Into the that you could find children. in the bodies of children and it helped to stop above ground testing. That's uh, right. That was one of the main factors was that mm. people knew that, that they were ingesting this. So we're down to about four minutes so we're going to kind of Keep this thing. <laughs> well, I, I know, know that we, we've got know, more than four you know minutes. You know me. I love to, to do the show and tell stuff, and I'd like to just switch just a little bit. Sure. Because I think a lot of people out there wonder to themselves: you know, nuclear power is a problem. We're going to take out nuclear power plants. Global warming is a problem. We're going to take out fossil fuel plants. What the hell are we going to do here? Mm. Where are we going to ultimately get our power? Right. And this is one of the reasons why I'm so grateful that Occupy Portland has brought out Dr. Helen Caldicott. Because Dr. Caldicott, who is n renowned as a um, activist against nuclear weapons and against the operation of nuclear power plants mm -hmm. because of medical health reasons also shares the concern about what we're going to do with fossil fuels and the health impact of the fossil fuel contaminants that are in the atmosphere. And she went to Dr. Arjun Makajani at the Institute for an Enver uh, Energy and Environmental Research and she asked him to do an analysis of whether it was possible mm -hmm. to, to shut down and not rely on the, fo the coal plants in this country and the nuclear plants in this country. And he wrote a book based upon the results of that analysis entitled Carbon Free and Nuclear Free. And you don't even have to buy the book. That's the, that's the, the amazing thing about this. You can get this book 
for free on the internet. All you got to do is go to IEER's website and they offer links to where you can download this as a PDF copy. So if you've got problems raising the funds, here's a way to educate yourself. And it is important to educate ourselves. Uh -huh. And then last but not least, there is Amory Lovins, who I have a great deal of respect for. He has a, he has a website uh, at the Rocky Mountain Institute, which is on, again, all you got to do is just, you know, Google uh, Amory Lovins or Google the Rocky Mountain Institute. He has just published a book. I've not finished reading this book, but boy, what I've read on it, it, it is a fascinating read, and it's entitled Reinventing Fire. And the subtitle is nice title, Bold but, uh, Business Solutions for the New Energy Era. And what he is doing, again, is bringing together all the ingenuity and creativity that shows, just like Arjun Makajani, that we don't have to rely upon coal or, nuclear, or fossil fuels or nuclear plants in order to have an energy future. One in which we don't have to sit here and talk about gathering up baby teeth or trying to get somebody to analyze our food yeah, right. so that we know whether or not we're getting poisoned or yeah. our children are not going to be born with genetic mm -hmm. uh, damage. Right. Sure. right on. Right. Well, you got a quick sound bite there, Chuck? No. no. <laughs> After that, no, I, I think that's a good way what to end. What he said. You know, <laughs> I, I really am glad you brought that out. I mean, I, it's a good way to end. It absolutely is. It and is. in the Northwest, we are fortunate with all the hydropower we have. As, that's as, right. as, much, as many problems as it causes to fish. Um, at, at least we have uh, that to rely on now to, co to completely phase out nuclear energy. And, and so I think we, should, we having that opportunity, there's no reason not to do it right away. All right. Well, Miriam, you got about a few seconds here. You'd I do. I would just tell everybody to um, Google A15 Hanford Rally. All right. Come on down. Come yeah. on down. <laughs> well, I want to emphasize also what, what Lloyd was saying about Occupy Portland. Occupy Portland isn't just out there saying, nay, 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 nay. You folks are offering an incredible amount of, of things that people can do, whether it's corporate personhood or uh, alternate energy, whatever. There's a lot of, lot of uh, answers out there. And yeah, it isn't just the skies falling. There, there, there is people building uh, projects, campaigns, and, and instruments in, in order to fix the problem. So I yep. guess that's it for now. We'll have to uh, come back next week. I want to thank the crew. Uh, I want to thank the guests. Thank you. Great, thank you. Great, great yep. job. Yep, thanks. See you next thanks. week. Thanks a lot.